Welcome to the second presentation in Unit 5 entitled Resistance is Futile, and that's our quote by John Luke Picard. It says, students will be able to predict if a substance will be a conductor or insulator, manipulate Ohm's law to solve for an unknown variable, and calculate the power used by a circuit. So, here's what we already knew. We know that electrons can flow because opposites attract. We talked about that in the first presentation, how you have something that's a positive charge and it wants to get to the negative side, or you have something at the negative side, it wants to get to the positive side. And you also know that a circuit requires a complete path to functions and a voltage source. So you need both of those things in order for this to be, uh, in order to work. Now, what we learned in the lab is that voltage and current are directly related. So in other words, if you increase the voltage, you will see a corresponding increase in the current. In other words, doubling the voltage, taking the voltage from 10 volts to 20 volts, will likely or will always take the current from like, let's say two amps to four amps. So if you double the voltage, you double the current. Now, Resistors are electrical devices that can slow down or stop the flow of charge. Whenever we look at these things, whenever it's something that slows down the charge a lot, specifically we call it a resistor. Now resistors have color codes that depending on what classes you take in the future, you may need to actually memorize those particular color codes because they all mean something different. But they basically escalate in terms of resistance. This thing right here has the largest resistance which means that it will slow down electrons the most. Oops. So now, what a resistor is, as we've already kind of talked about a little bit, is it is something that actually uses the electricity that you think of. So lights, heaters, even RAM chips from computers actually contain resistors that actually use the energy that you give them in some sort of meaningful and useful way. Now, we need to be able to distinguish between conductors and insulators. The reason being is that conductors actually allow electricity to flow through them, so they are very, very, very poor resistors. In other words, if you want something to slow down or stop electrical current, you don't want to use a conductor, but you would want to use an insulator. Conductors are generally thought of as things that have a very loose hold on their valence electrons. They're very easy to find on the periodic table because they tend to be right in the middle. Specifically, we call, we call that the D uh, or transition metals. Basically, those are what you think of as traditional metals. Copper is an excellent conductor of electricity and is what most homes generally have their wires made out of within the walls of the house. Okay, you also have things like aluminum, uh, gold even, nobody really has wires made out of gold except for in your TV if you have an HDMI cable. Okay. In addition to that we have insulators. Insulators have a really tight hold on their valence electrons and because of that these things right here are very very poor conductors. Okay, These tend to be things like plastics or um, if you look at the far sides of the periodic table you tend to see insulators there. Now, there are other types of conductors, uh, one being a superconductor, and basically what a superconductor is, is even with regular conductors, you lose some energy as the energy moves through the wire. So let's say that I had 100 joules of energy here, over here I'm going to have like 99 joules of energy, and that's with the best wire over a short distance. Realistically, whenever you're looking at the power company, whenever they have 100 joules there, if they can get 20 joules to the other side, that's great. But what they're doing is they're losing a great deal of energy as they move through the wire. What a superconductor is, is it's a wire, basically, that loses no energy as it moves through. So if you have 100 joules here, you have 100 joules here. It's a great device to actually make, but the problem is, in order to create a superconductor, they have to be cooled very, very, very low. Like minus 350 degrees Fahrenheit low. And because of that, they take so much energy to make that they're not useful in making real wires like outside to bring electricity to your house. There are also things that are called semiconductors, and those semiconductors actually have varying resistance depending on the temperature. You find those mostly in computers. Things like silicone are examples of uh, semiconductors. As the temperature increases, generally the resistance increases as well. Now, you can find these periodic table 
uh, these conductors on the periodic table. Like we said, most of the conductors that you tend to see tend to be found in the middle of the periodic table. We call them the transition metals. Now, not all of them are as good at conductors as um, the rest of them. The best ones tend to be things like silver and gold, copper, nickel tends to be a good one, you have iron, titanium. These are examples of things that you generally traditionally think of as metals. In addition to that, lead is a generally a good conductor of electricity and aluminum. The reason why we choose to make things out of certain wires generally isn't because there's a big difference in the conductivity. It usually has more to do with cost than anything. Now there are lots of factors that can affect resistance in a general wire. Um, generally we think of resistance as traffic or something that slows down charges and moves through a wire. Now if we're talking only about wires, there is some resistance in a wire. Now it's usually pretty small, but whenever you look at it in a certain way, the longer the wire there is, uh, the more likely you're going to have resistance increase. So if you're trying to decrease resistance, you want to have a very short wire. Okay. You also want to choose what you make the wire out of. For example, if you make it out of silver, silver is an excellent conductor. But if you were to make it out of something like, let's say, uh, glass or plastic, those are very, very poor conductors. Finally, you have the area of a wire. If you have a very thin wire, say that's this line right in the middle, there's very few pathways that electrons can move around. So because of that, the resistance increases whenever you have a very, very, very narrow wire. So if you're trying to make a wire, you want to have it be a relatively short wire. You want it to have a relatively wide wire. You want to be careful what you make it out of. Now, a lot of ways, the easiest way to remember this is to look at it in terms of traffic. Whenever you're driving on the road, you'd like to drive on a short road that has a lot of lanes and is made out of a, a nice concrete or asphalt road as opposed to some sort of dirt road or or sand road or something else. So a lot of times people think of resistance, you can think of traffic to see whether or not resistance goes up or down. Now it says match the term with the use. A conductor does allow current to pass and an insulator does inhibit current from passing. When we look at this thing right here we say which elements are most likely to be electrical conductors. They are the ones right in here that we call the D or the transition metals because they have the D orbital. It says what elements are insulators most likely made of? These are things like plastics. Okay, um, when it's, we talk about elements, if they're made out of plastics they're generally carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, those sorts of things. In other words, non-metals. Okay, it says a student is conducting an experiment that requires the delivery of voltage to a device with as little resistance as possible. Design a wire that does this. So the first thing is we want very, very little resistance. So we're going to want a short wire. We're going to want it to be wide. And actually the best conductor that we can come up with is gold. Now gold is going to be expensive and it may be prohibitively expensive, but it is the best conductor that we can use. Now. The second part of this lab that we looked at is that voltage, current, and resistance have a relationship between them. Voltage is not inherently dangerous. So a lot of times you'll see danger, high voltage. Okay, Voltage is not by itself dangerous, but what happens is voltage is directly related to current. And current is what is dangerous. Current can kill you depending on the circumstances. What they do is an electrical shock, what you generally think of as electrical shock, is current. You can use current to stop or start hearts depending on the situation. A lot of times surgeons will stop someone's heart if they're going to do some sort of heart procedure. Or you can restart it if somebody's had a heart attack. So that's an example of using electrical current. It can be very dangerous when we're working with electrical current. Now the relationship that we have is actually something called Ohm's Law, which is V equals IR. V stands for voltage, which is measured in volts, which is actually really easy. It's the only one where the name matches the variable, matches the unit, matches what it's measured by. So V is voltage, which is measured with volts and is measured by a voltometer or a voltmeter. Okay, I actually stands for electric current. 
Okay, why is it not currency or e? It's because it was a French word that's intensia. But electric current is I and is measured with the unit of A or amps and is measured with an ammeter. And finally, you have electrical resistance, and that's kind of the rate of charge and area. So it's how much will it slow electrons down? And it's actually measured with this Greek letter, which is a capital omega, which looks like this. So that right there is something that has to be calculated. You have to measure the voltage and the current of something and then calculate the resistance. So it says match the units with the variables. We talked about current is amps, resistance is ohms, and voltage is volts. Now it says what voltage is a battery uh, that is attached to a circuit if 10 ohm resistor produces 0.2 amps of current. Now whenever we're working with a formula, remember we would like to use the guess method where we take all our variables and we say, okay, what is the voltage? Question mark. 10 ohm resistor, R. 0 0.2 amps of current, A. Here I've done my given information and my unknown, and now I write my equation. V equals IR, and I say, okay, V equals 0 0.2 times 10. Multiply those two together, and you get 2 volts. It says which of these has the highest resistance value and you have potential difference which is another word for voltage and you have electric current which is I. Well if you look at the equation V equals IR and you say okay if I take V and I divide it by I I would get R. That's a rearrangement of this particular equation. Now when you do this you see that V over I is R, and that's the same thing as the slope, the rise over the run. Because of that, you would say that A actually has the largest resistor value. Now, you have to be really careful when you do these, because a lot of the times you'll see I here and V here. And the reason is, depending on the circumstances of your investigation, you usually want to put your independent variable, or what you change in the lab, on the x-axis. When you do that, Voltage is generally something that you can change much easier than you can change electric current. Next it says, what current does a 9 volt battery produce if the resistance of a motor is 6 ohms? So once again, we want to do V equals IR, but we want to do our given information. So you have 9 volts, you have 6 ohms, and in this case you're actually looking for the electric current. What makes this is a mastery level question is not that it's very difficult, but you actually have to rearrange this equation. When you do this, you get 9 equals I times 6. So you actually have to solve for I algebraically. You divide both sides by 6, and when you divide both sides by 6, you get I equals 1.5 amps. Okay, on the next one, it says power is the rate, electric power, and electric power is the rate at which energy is used. Whenever you look at this, we've talked about power before when we talked about energy. And it says, you can easily see it with electricity by looking at a light bulb. The brighter the light, the more energy is used. Now, there's a couple of assumptions there. You're assuming that you're talking about the same type of bulb. Okay, we now have new different types of bulbs, things like CFLs and LEDs. And it's real difficult to compare the brightness to the power based on these. Electric power is P equals IV where P stands for power. Now we've talked about power earlier this year when we talked about energy. So you've seen power. Power is the rate at which energy is consumed and it's measured in the watts. So that is not new. And you have current and voltage which we talked about in the previous formula. If you multiply current and voltage together you actually get, it, get power. So if we look at this it says match the units with the variables below. We say current is measured with amps, voltage is measured in volts, and power is measured in watts. So the two light bulbs are lit up below. Which light bulb has a higher wattage? Now assuming they are the same type of bulb, this one right here is going to have the higher wattage. So the watts are greater. Now remember watts is the unit of power. Now the reason I know that is because this is brighter. Now that is assuming that they are the same type of bulb. If they are different types of bulb, there is no comparison that you can make. Okay, the next example says, what is the power of a laser that uses a 0 0.4 amp of current when connected to a 10,000 volt source? So I'm doing a calculation. I'm looking for the power. 
this is what is the power. 0 0.4 amps is a current. It tells me that I'm connected to a 10,000 volt source. And as a result of that, I can say P equals IV. When I plug my numbers in, I can say 0 0.4 times 10,000 ends up being 4,000 watts. In the final one we have here, you actually have a circuit schematic. So there's kind of a lot going on here and you're trying to figure out what's actually going on. It says a circuit is built in which a nine volt battery, so I can say voltage is nine, is connected to a 100 ohm resistor. There's a 100 ohm resistor. Okay, it says when the switch is closed, what is the power dissipated by the circuit? So I'm trying to figure out what the power is. Now the first thing that you should look at this is the circuit is not functioning as is because there's a break in the circuit. So the circuit doesn't work, but it says when the switch is closed. So it's saying if we close this thing and make it connect, then what do you have? So we have P equals IV, but the problem here is I have V and that's great, but I don't have I. So I have to look and say, okay, is there a way for me to be able to figure out what I is? Well, the only, the only other formula I have that has I in it is V equals IR. And if you look, I do have V and I do have R. So that'll actually allow me to use Ohm's law and say nine equals I times 100. Okay, when I do that, I need to solve for I, divide both sides by 100, and I get I equals 0 0.09. Now that I have my I, I can now plug it into my original equation. So I can say that P is equal to I, which is 0 0.09, times 9, which is 0.81 watts.